The China Burma India Theatre, more recognizable by the name CBI, is one of the most important theatres of the Pacific War. It was here that the Japanese had been fighting since 1937. It was here that the Empire of the Rising Sun had most of its land forces, and it was here where one of their primary goals lay – dominion over East Asia. But the contributions of the forces fighting in this gruesome theatre are often not well known. Today, after the epic conclusion of the Guadalcanal campaign, and after the end of the bloody Battle of Bunagona, we finally return to China, Burma and India to cover some new developments that were unfolding during the months of January and February with new operations taking place in China, with more political bickering going on in India, and with the start of one of the most recognizable long-range penetration expeditions, Operation Longcloth. Hey all, as you know, Turkey and Syria suffered a devastating earthquake on the 6th of February. The death toll is in the tens of thousands, many tens of thousands are wounded, and millions became homeless and will suffer in the aftermath. For obvious reasons, it's difficult to find a reliable way to support our brothers and sisters in Syria, but we can do our best to help Turkey. All money we make from this video will go towards the Turkey Earthquake Relief Fund. You can join us in this endeavor. If you have the ability to do that, please press the donate button to the right of the video. The Turkish people are desperate for help and every dollar helps. Thank you. Our story first takes us back to the spring of 1942. While Generals Stilwell and Slim were fighting to escape annihilation at Burma, Colonel Ord Wingate was appointed by General Wavell to organize some guerrilla units that were going to be employed to fight behind Japanese lines. Wavell had first met Wingate during the Arab revolts in British Palestine, as the Indian officer began to organize the Special Night Squads, a joint British-Jewish counterinsurgency military unit that frequently ambushed Arab saboteurs who attacked oil pipelines of the Iraq Petroleum Company. Wavell recalled, I first met Wingate when I took over command in Palestine in 1937 and found him on my intelligence staff. I inquired about him and was told he was rather an oddity clever but eccentric. He knew Arabic well, but since coming to Palestine had developed pronounced Zionist tendencies and was now learning Yiddish or Hebrew. When I met him I realized there was a remarkable personality behind those piercing eyes and rather abrupt manner. He was obviously no respecter of persons because of their rank. When World War II began, Wingate was invited to Sudan by Wavell, then commander-in-chief of Middle East Command to begin operations against Italian occupation forces in Ethiopia. Thus, he created Gideon Force, a special operations force composed of British, Sudanese and Ethiopian soldiers that would harass Italian forts and their supply lines with the aid of local resistance fighters, while regular army units took on the main Italian army. It was during this time that he first met Slim and that he first began to develop his concept of long-range penetration which proposed that it was possible for units well behind the front lines to conduct regular warfare. Rather than standard guerrilla, Wingate therefore wanted to employ small bands of men in hit-and-run raids or sabotage, relying on company or even battalion-sized forces to engage the enemy. He even said that, in the back areas are the enemy's unprotected kidneys, his midriff, his throat and other vulnerable points. The more vital and tender points of the enemy's anatomy we hit, the more the enemy would have to withdraw troops from the front in order to protect them. Yet Burma was a far different topographical and tactical theater than the plains and deserts of the Middle East and East Africa, where the fight was against poorly motivated Italian soldiers. Because of that, during his first months in Burma and India, Wingate had to carefully study the terrain, the resources and the disposition of the enemy forces. Finally, in August 1942, Wingate was promoted to the rank of Brigadier to command the 77th Indian Brigade, joined by experienced guerrilla fighters such as Major Michael Calvert. This brigade was formed by a battalion of young Gurkhas from Nepal, a battalion of the Burma Rifles that mixed Karen, Kachin and Chin people, and the inexperienced British 13th Battalion from the King's Regiment. A scattering of RAF officers and non-coms also joined Wingate's forces to coordinate by radio the necessary airdrops. Wingate's unit, popularly known as the Chindits, would have to undergo a brutal training period, 
with prolonged marches in sweltering heat and mock battles. They learned to leave established trails that could harbour ambushes and to hack their way through dense undergrowth. Furthermore, Wingate strictly imposed a series of directives, such as to eat at least one raw onion per day or to only wear shorts when raining, and he also inspired his men to forage until they could subsist on the fauna around them. Inevitably, the strict regimen proved too much for many, especially the older, and so in September of 1942, about 200 of them had to be replaced with younger or more fit men drafted from other units. Those who survived the training ordeal, however, developed a strong sense of self-esteem. In 1943, as part of the strategy that began with the campaign in the Arakan, Wavell had plotted the insertion of the Chindits into central Burma. Yet the British were facing many obstacles at Arakan, and the planned operations against northern Burma had to be suspended, so Wavell feared that the Japanese could fully concentrate on Wingate's incursion. Nonetheless, Wingate persuaded Wavell to let him proceed into Burma anyway, so Operation Loincloth was eventually approved. 3,000 soldiers and nearly 1,000 animals were to be dispatched over the Chindwin in points where the long, sinuous river was not manned by the enemy. The first objective for the Chindits was a north-to-south rail line used by the Japanese to supply and reinforce their forces in China. It was expected that demolition of the railway might force the enemy to devote resources to protecting it and signal the ability of the British Empire to mount an offensive after enduring such a long series of beatings in the east. On February 12th, Wingate thus set out with his chindits organized into seven separate columns to cross the Chidwin River at two places, 35 miles apart, so as to confuse the enemy. They used inflatable dinghies and rafts hacked out of the bamboo and vegetation and ropes. The southern group, under Lieutenant Colonel Lee Alexander, consisting of only two columns, had successfully crossed the Chindwin at Oktang by February 16th. There, the RAF had created a large supply drop to draw the attention of the Japanese, and Major John Jeffries had also been sent, disguised as a brigadier, to convince the enemy that Wingate was with them. The Gurkhas would then have to fight their way towards an elephant path, southeast of Mainyong, from where they would destroy the railway station at Kyaik Thin. The ensuing days were a tale of hunger and exhaustion for the commandos, wading through streams for miles and manhandling loads while on short rations, until they finally arrived in the Thaktor area by late February, where they received the long-awaited supply drop. Meanwhile, the northern group under Wingate and Lieutenant Colonel Sidney Cook consisting of the five remaining columns, had stealthily crossed the Chindwin at Tonhe by February 14th. Overconfident because of their absolute victory during the invasion of Burma, and believing that the area to the west of the Zibu Mountains was not suitable for large-scale operations, the Japanese hardly defended the path that the Chindits were taking. Once across, columns 3 and 5 were sent to cut the railway line in as many places as possible, and the remaining three columns were ordered to seek out and engage the enemy. Yet, unbeknownst to them, an imprecise supply drop had jettisoned its load of mail on a sandbank within a mile or two of a Japanese outpost the following day, directly alerting them of the British presence in the area and giving them the complete order of battle of the Chindits. As a result, the Japanese began to evacuate the area on February 19th, successfully evacuating all posts between the Chindwin and the Mu Valley by February 24th. In the meantime, the Chindits would arrive at Miene on February 15th, where they received their first supply drop. In that village, there was also an incident with a girl that complained about the behavior of one of the British soldiers, so the commandos were given a strict warning directly from the top that if anyone interfered with a Burmese girl, Wingate would personally shoot that man in front of the assembled villagers. As he pointed out, their lives were dependent on these villagers being on their side. The Chindits then received reports of Japanese troops at Sin Lamang, so a big party under Colonel Cook would be sent to raid them, arriving on the night of February 24th, only to find that the enemy had already fled. By the end of February, the commandos had received another supply drop at Tonmakeng, and they had then crossed the Zibu Tongdan range by a little-known path, which had been used during the retreat to India. We'll have to leave the Chindits for now, but we'll continue to cover their impressive expedition in the future. Instead, we have to take a quick detour to Morocco, where the Allies had met at the Casablanca Conference from January 14th to 24th, 1943. 
during their discussions about their overall strategy for the next stage of the war. The US and the UK would reaffirm their strategy of Europe first, yet many differences would arise during the debates about the war with Japan. As the circumstances had changed, the Allies now held the initiative in the Pacific. The Americans were planning to develop offensive and defensive operations against Japan, parallel with operations in the Mediterranean, believing it would be a mistake to give the Japanese time to consolidate their conquests in the Pacific. Whereas the British underestimated the Japanese capabilities, believing that the enemy war effort was incapable of much further expansion, provided communications with Germany were kept severed. Experience had shown to the Americans that the Japanese fought with no idea of surrendering, and would continue to be aggressive until defeated by attrition. In that regard, Admiral King wanted to apply constant pressure upon the Japanese with the continuation of a series of limited offensives in the Pacific, and General Marshall proposed to augment the total amount of Allied resources for the Pacific theatre from 15% to 30%. The British opposed this, as they argued that the most effective way of bringing the war to a swift conclusion was to concentrate everything on defeating Germany, and then to devote all possible resources against Japan. Though there would be no agreement during this conference, Casablanca would foreshadow the larger role of thinking and planning for the strategic offensive against Japan in the future Allied Strategic Councils. As for the CBI theater, planning continued for Operation Anakim and the Burma Offensive, Yet the British were similarly unenthusiastic about extensive commitments in this theatre as well. The British argued that the depleted condition of their eastern fleet prevented them from carrying a naval supremacy campaign in the Bay of Bengal. So in the end, Chiang Kai-shek would refuse to support an incursion into northern Burma because of the lack of British naval forces at hand. Thus, Operation Anakim would have to be projected for late 1943 without any previous Chinese attack towards the Salween. During this meeting, President Roosevelt would also state his intentions to treat China as a great power, an ally to be built up for war and post-war purposes, as he believed that China might eventually serve the Allied cause in a position somewhat analogous to that of the USSR in the war against Germany. Therefore, he wanted to send a larger amount of resources to China to make more use of Chinese bases and manpower, and he was also adamant that the supply routes to China were to be restored. Yet nonetheless, as the focus remained in Europe, and the prospects for an enlarged scale of operations in the Pacific were growing, the CBI was likely to receive the short end of the stick. Lastly, another important effect of the Casablanca Conference is that the free French forces held by Generals Charles de Gaulle and Henri Giraud began to be recognized as preferred partners of the Allies. Up until now, the Japanese had recognized only the Vichy government as legitimate, so they had decided to not declare war on the free French forces. They would thus respect the sovereignty of French territories in Asia, like the concession of Guangzhou One, which declared itself a part of free France. The only exception was French Indochina, which was invaded in September 1940, but was allowed to remain under nominal Vichy control. Yet for the case of Guangzhou One, the Japanese would only establish an exclusion zone around the French colony. In turn, Chiang Kai-shek's regime recognized Free France as Guangzhou One's legitimate authority, with many Chinese soldiers of the Fourth War area escaping to the French colony, where Japanese forces couldn't harm them. After the Casablanca Conference, however, Tokyo finally decided to put an end to the French presence in China, and ordered the 23rd Army of General Sakai to establish a strong presence in the Leichao Peninsula. On February 13th, Two battalions of the 23rd Independent Mixed Brigade thus departed Hong Kong en route to the Luichao Peninsula, landing at the village of Peichatsun three days later and immediately engaging the scarce Chinese defenders. With strong determination, the Japanese rapidly made their way through 1,500 meters of knee-deep shoals to capture the towns of Sinlaitsun and Haikang, forcing the Chinese forces to withdraw towards Suichi. On February 17th, the invaders would then continue northwards, eliminating the last center of enemy resistance on Cheng Yuashi, and in the next few days, they would capture the towns of Suichi and Chikan, thus completing the encirclement of the French colony, and finally forcing the Chinese to retreat into the interior of the country. After some negotiations with representatives of Guangzhou Wan, the French would have no other choice but to declare the least territory an open city, so the Japanese would occupy Guangzhou Wan without a fight. 
Additionally, a 3rd Battalion of the 23rd Independent Mixed Brigade landed on the northern part of Hainan Island and established a base at Haiko Bay. The operation was a total success for the Japanese Empire, allowing them to link the Luichao Peninsula with the occupied zones of the province of Guangxi and to eliminate Guangzhou 1 as a possible base for an Allied offensive. Back in China, Stilwell's initial and personal reaction to the Generalissimo's withdrawal from the projected March 1943 offensive was an indignant one. But after he had surveyed the new situation and mapped out his course of action, he wrote in his diary that it was a damn good thing March 1st is off, we'd have been hung. Furthermore, Stilwell believed the Chinese very likely would try to compensate for their withdrawal, so he decided to present again his now familiar proposals for reorganization and concentration of the Chinese army, service schools, and an efficient logistical organization. The proposed agreement also had three significant new points. To assist in the reorganization, training and future planning of the Chinese Air Force under Chenault's control, to develop a line of communications from the terminus of the Burma Road to East China, and to propose that the designation and reorganization of the second 30 divisions begin at once. As the program to build effective Chinese infantry divisions at Ramgar proceeded, even though Chinese commanders laid their typical complaints during their stay in India, the China Air Task Force continued to sting the enemy with its limited resources, with Chenault periodically dispatching his small fleet of B-25s and P-40s against Japanese targets, particularly shipping in harbours. Relying on surprise and deception to give its raiders an edge, the CATF would manage to cause much damage to the Japanese air forces in China. Yet Chenault was dissatisfied with these achievements and wanted to do more, arguing that if he were given sufficient strength in bombers and fighters, then the Japanese could be defeated through strategic bombing without having to do a slow and costly campaign in manpower and war materials. Because of this, General Arnold was dispatched to determine the feasibility of Chenault's proposals but he instead found too many logistical obstacles to make Chenault's plans a reality. Next episode, we'll head back to the Aleutian and Solomon Islands, where new developments are about to unfold, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.